All right. All right, hello everyone, welcome back. So uh, we're gonna look at, at chapter six from the Dawn of Everything, Gardens of Adonis, the revolution that never happened, how Neolithic peoples avoided agriculture. And one of the points that uh, the, the two Davids uh, used to conclude chapter five was that if we want to understand the origins of, of domination, that domination appears first in the most intimate of, of settings at a, very, at a domestic level. And so politics, self-consciously egalitarian politics emerge to prevent those relations from extending beyond the small worlds into this imagined public sphere. And what the two uh, uh, Davids uh, argue from that point is that if we want to understand how the, the roots of, of domination begin, that we can't find the roots of it in the public sphere unless it appears in the private sphere first. And what has happened is a lot of scholars have argued starting with Rousseau, that once agriculture was developed, that humans uh, leapt headlong into their, into their own chains. And Wengro and Graeber argue that this is really a, a, a false reading of the evidence, or it's a, a simplified reading of the evidence, and that the, the process, the phenomenon that scholars have come to regard as the agricultural revolution was a much more complicated, drawn out affair than has, has typically um, been understood. That it's a term that goes back to the work of, of Gordon Child and that there was no single agricultural revolution. And so they, they uh, the, the two authors look at a lot of the evidence that has emerged since the 2000s, um, largely in sites in, in Turkey, to show that the, the process that people have, have assumed to be fairly schematic was much more, much more complicated and that there has been a, a great degree of seasonal variation in, in uh, social structure. And so to talk of there being a single agricultural revolution is really to distort what was a, at least a 3000 year long process where farming may, instead of actually putting people on a course toward violent domination may have actually over these 3000 years put them on a course away from violent domination. And so it's a, a complete rethinking of some of the, the conventional approaches uh, to the agricultural revolution. What I found so eye-opening, so I, I was of course uh, educated in, in the United States and I can recall distinctly, and it's still being taught in the school where I teach, this idea of the Fertile Crescent. And the school where I teach, we have an entire year long course called Ancient Civilizations that I'm in the process of completely revamping it, in large part because of this book, because what they point out that to me had never even dawned on me is that there were many fertile crescents and to think of there just being one single, cre single fertile crescent where the Tigris and Euphrates met is, is very, uh, not only naive, but that it's archeologically false and that there are in fact many fertile crescents and that within the one that we understand as the fertile crescent, that even there, that there was an upland sector and a lowland sector and so the authors point out that, the, that there was a schizogenetic process going on throughout these 3000 years where upland sectors, inhabitants of the up, upland sectors were really living in ways that were fundamentally oppositional to, to some of the ways that the lowland sector folks were. And so, there was this conscious comparison of culture, 
and um, uh, of, of uh, refusal and that it, it isn't really accurate to think of there being one simple teleological uh, stretch from the, from the cultivation of seeds into the domestication of seeds. And in fact, the authors spend a, a, a fair amount of time nicely problematizing what exactly is meant by these terms, agriculture versus cultivation versus domestication, because some of the archeologists have ended up having to rely on terms that that to Wengro and Graeber are kind of problematic, like pre-domestication cultivation. And when you're getting into sort of slippery concepts like that, it really makes one question what are meant by these, these terms. And that there's often been a, um, a tendency among archeologists, predominantly male archeologists, to also think of this agricultural revolution in very gendered terms as something, I mean, if you think of the word domestication, it, it does hint at what is gendered, where domestication, if it's being done by, um, by women, it, it often hasn't been understood by scholars as, as a, a gendered process. And so women have, women have often been marginalized or completely excluded in the historical or in the archeological record. Um, and that much of the domestication that went on uh, could very well have been uh, done at the hands of, of women. And that this switch from paleolithic forager to neolithic farmer never really happened the way that we are conventionally taught that, that it does. Um, and that farming may have actually been more play gardening than actual agriculture, because as they, I think, very convincingly show that this, this 3000 year period was one of, of great cultural variety to such an extent that to really talk about this switch happening and forever remaining in place isn't really, um, isn't really uh, uh, fair to the, to the record. So uh, to me, this is such a pivotal uh, chapter because it really is, I, I think, the heart of their, their um, argument about the importance of schizmogenesis as a as a um, as a factor in understanding uh, society, that that certain societies deliberately and consciously organized themselves in ways that were in contrast to their to neighboring societies because they were able to see the kinds of of social consequences that particular kinds of of um, uh, social systems can can create. So, for me, this is a uh, a really wonderful chapter that lays out, I think, most clearly the beginnings of the of the the argument about how archaeology, or excuse me, how agriculture is not necessarily the foundation of of um, domination in society and that farming was actually something that, that people could move in and out of. And the book does, or this chapter does such a good job of restoring humanity to the, to the historical actors because it never assumes that one group if one group saw benefits to agriculture, that another group would have seen those benefits in the same exact way. And so that what may have been a benefit to uh, a, a ruling elite may not have been a benefit to a more egalitarian society like in the lowland sector of the, um, of the Fertile Crescent. So this, uh, this chapter, I think archaeologists 
um, I mean, the reviews that I've read, the archaeologists have not really taken issue with this sort of chapter. Um, I, I find that it's it's based on on a lot of uh, strong secondary secondary research that um, that shows how scholars' understandings of terms like agricultural revolution or patriarchy or matriarchy or cultivation or domestication that scholars have in the 20th century used those terms in ways that uh, have loaded them full of, of cultural baggage where the terms themselves kind of explain the actual outcome in a very teleological way. So if, if an agricultural revolution is understood as domination of of agriculture, then it's understood in these gendered terms as being something male-driven more than uh, being female-driven. And what one of the things that I love so much about the uh, the the chapter is how it opens with this uh, quote from Plato about the Garden of Adonis and the choices that people will make between whether to uh, cultivate quickly or to sow their, their, um, their seeds in, a, in a, a slower, more deliberate way. And it really points up that even before Rousseau, in the times of Plato, that a lot of these ideas were already kind of becoming um, fixed. And so the idea that we have today that once we started practicing agriculture that we became fixed, is more a reflection of our own 20th century thinking, or maybe even you know, going back as, as far as, as Plato, but that it's not necessarily the thinking that the people in these times actually had. So as they do in other chapters, they really are relying on this epistemology of imagination where they're giving the historical actors a level of political imagination that I that that scholars in the past have not given them, because we're able to see that just because one group adopted agriculture didn't mean that every other group would fall in line behind that. And when we're talking about a, a phase of time three thousand years long, it's really impossible to talk about there being one single revolution that ended up culminating the same everywhere. So to the extent that we are stuck, it's a matter of our thinking today more than it is an actual practice that has um, continued with us since the, the dawn of, of agriculture. So it, it's a, another wonderful reminder that the authors are making this implicit argument that we do not have to live the way that we live at any given time and that there isn't necessarily a specific political ideology that's associated with a specific mode of production. And that modes of production, they even mentioned this at one point, that, um, that you know, some of these some of these movements can be kind of, of of arbitrary. They even use the expression "roll of the dice," and so they're they're trying to kind of break up these these patterns that humans have come to believe inevitably lead to us enchaining ourselves um, in this this yoke of of agriculture, and so I find. This chapter, though, about the, the, the shift or this era between the, um, the, um, the Paleolithic period and the Neolithic period, these 3,000 years in between, even though they're writing about times many, many, many years ago, the suggestion that these sorts of, of ideas apply to today um, really to me stands out that people are not destined to live particular ways just because it seems that that's where we have ended up. 
and that at any given time, we as a people can consciously refuse and go a different direction. So for me, this is uh, sort of like the heart of the book because it lays out what I think is a very straightforward and empirically rich argument that to me is really easy to grasp because if we assume that a revolution happened, then it's a revolution that took 3000 years. And how are we really talking about a revolution if we're talking about something that took 3000 years and that people moved in and out of? It's just much too simplistic to think of it that way. So I find this to be a, um, uh, an article or a chapter that I can't wait to share with colleagues of mine who, who studied the ancient period, um, because I'm not sure that, that the, the research that has been done since the late 1990s, it's out there, but I don't know if it's, I mean, it hasn't been synthesized in this way. Um, and so I, I, I think that this is just like required reading for, uh, for everyone. So let me open it up there with just sort of, you know, general overview. And I'd love to hear people's thoughts on, on uh, what they found most um, uh, encouraging or perhaps problematic. People are free to chime in as they like. Um, just to point out one thing, while it, it's true that they have a related mode of production to um, inequality, to my knowledge, they haven't touched yet the concept of private property, right? Right. Okay. Right. They, yeah, and uh, spoiler alert, um, they end up arguing that private property doesn't really have a history that it that it's impossible to really argue where property where its history begins because we're it's impossible to know when the first person said this is mine and not yours and if we take that to be the understanding of private property then we we cannot know when its history began if we take private property to be uh, uh, an object that, re that requires a rule of law around it to hold it up or to exalt it as sacred, then they basically argue that we've got to understand private property's roots going back to um, the Roman Empire, to the Roman era. Um, we'll, we'll cover that chapter in the, in the coming weeks. Um, but you're absolutely right that in this, they're less worried about really determining when private property began and more just understanding when people's three elements of freedom started to disappear. Because as they mentioned, this isn't a, a history of inequality. It's more a history of how people became stuck into thinking that these relations are fixed, or more specifically, how these intimate relations of domination extended outside of the household and into this public sphere, which they're, you know, they're mindful to point out that that public sphere is itself an imagined sphere. There really are not hard and fast distinctions between what's public and what's private. And that that too is a is often a, a the result of of schizogenetic uh, process. One of the, uh, the oh, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, that they did didn't they do something on um, property as the part of the sacred in that in one of these things? I've already read it, although I did skim read a bunch forward to the end, but I've, for the most part, I've only got to this far. So I, I saw some of that on sort of sacred rituals and um, um, it was, yeah, it was some, some uh, yeah, it was a bunch of boys hiding a flute in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, the this is where, this is the terrible bad anthropology. We can know an anthropological story, but you can't identify where, I'd have to go back in the book to figure out where it was, what 
tribe it was, what continent it was, and all that. Um, um, but the um, I, I, I guess I'm, I was it was interesting that they um, like how little is known. And they spend a lot of time going over all the evidence and saying, we can't really know what's going on. And it's a very cautious kind of, well, maybe it could be this, maybe it could be this. It does seem like they're decapitating a bunch of people over here and they have these other figurines <laughs> over here. Um, and, uh, and, and it's very kind of cautious and, and excoriating every other anthropologist or archeologist who might say, this is what it is. And then the very final, um, the final uh, summary, kind of like in the last uh, page, is sort of like, okay, so it does seem like this is what's happened, and though they have been very cautious, it was quite a, it was sort of a witty moment. But when they were summarizing, they were like these yeah. types of behaviors that kept going, and one was like looking through windows, and yeah. I was like, oh, <laughs> so that miss, I missed that bit that, like that, to what extent agriculture has to do with settling into buildings um because presumably before this period people found it more particularly if you're mobile all the time found you either live sometimes people have specific, you, you know cave dwellings or something but like mostly you would have like a, i don't know what you would call wigwam type type move, move mobility and all that so i i, I kind of find some of that um Surprising. I was excited that whatever is the, the word Kurgan shows up um, and um, somewhere in there. And this was a part of a, a funny conversation um, we had when we we're talking about the um, fight club. And I was advocating um, somewhat humorously that we should get um, that movie from the 1980s um, with the Scott Highlander, um, where, the, where they try to chop each other's heads off um and uh and the one who's the, the bad guy the enemy is called the kurgan um who's the sort of famous as the either anthropology character and i was shocked that like that kurgan isn't actually a term for those people it's a term by archaeologists for some type of feature that they have in their burial sites or whatnot so like like it's, it's funny that it that, that that name is not even a real tribal name how many names are kind of these name like don't really mean what you think they mean you just hit, heard it from someone else so can i can i throw something in Ooh. something yeah, something that know. i i think was this chapter um i i ended up i got i got uh, got out the book from the library and read through the whole thing and then had to return it so hmm. i'm not 100 percent sure exactly where everything's from um, my memory is, I think it was this chapter where one of the things that they, they talked about was how we, we tend to think about these ancient societies, sort of like nomadic hunter gatherer societies, whatever wrong, um, because the only examples that we have of modern, like hunter gatherer types are people who are living in land that nobody else wanted. And during, you know, before states took everything uh all of the best most productive parts of land were inhabited by people who weren't engaged in what we would typically think of as agriculture um and so you might have had societies that uh, and, and often these these are areas that maybe don't necessarily leave the best records um because you know often these are marshlands or sort of coastal areas and because of you know, climatic changes, exactly where the coastlines have been, have changed drastically over the years. Um, and so there may have been, like, we, we have evidence for pretty settled communities engaged, not engaged in agriculture uh, in marshlands, because they're incredibly, incredibly rich uh, ecological areas. Um, and you may have had, like, basically that, like, the it seems like we, we have this this belief that first came agriculture, then came sedentism, and they're really convincingly arguing that um, not only is that like that, that that's completely backwards. That sedentism came first, uh, and you have these societies uh, in the Fertile Crescent um, that sort of were doing play farming for thousands and thousands of years before they were working with like modernly recognizable domestic crops. 
Um, and I, anyway, I just, I love, I love the sort of, one of the things I love about Graeber is sort of he, you know, these things that you wouldn't have thought of. And then after, like once, once he's said it, you're like, oh, that makes, that makes perfect sense. And sort of this, this thing about the, the examples that we have of hunter-gatherer societies being the people in the least productive land and that being really unrepresentative of what things looked like in the past. Um, and I just, I love those moments. Thank you, Graber. <laughs> yeah, Ellen? Yeah, this is such a rich discussion and, and such a wonderful book to be talking about. Um, there are um, just a, a couple points that occurred to me, and they, they're not just about this chapter, but they run through. Um, I think it's really wonderful that they say so often that we don't know something, because the, the whole point is that what they're trying to do is to take down the people who claim to have all the answers, who are really dangerous people. <laughs> you know? So basically what that is, is a kind of rigorous way of keeping thought open. And so what they do, it, it, it's sort of a balancing act where they produce evidence that forces us to think in a different way while not claiming that that's the only way to think. And that's um, a really complicated, uh, I think, um, walking on a high wire type um, discursive strategy to follow. But I think that it's really encouraging when they say that because it's another way of forcing us to keep our thinking open. So I think that um, a lot of the weight of this particular chapter is against technological determinism, which is one of those ways of sort of saying, we know everything. And so they just uh, take that apart and, and maybe that's what they want to talk about more than the private property thing. Um, the, one of the real contributions, you know, maybe to be, boringly academic about this, is the extent to which they use archaeology. Because most of the arguments about um, evolution got drawn somewhat more from contemporary societies with all the problems that you know, Matthew has indicated, that they're, they're not our past, they're, they're our present. Um, and archaeology has been underused in a way. So what they're doing is um, accessing archaeology in a really fascinating way. But one of the things that they could be using in this chapter, but I think my guess is that the reason they don't is that their use of archaeology is such a contribution. But what they do also have available is there's a lot of contemporary evidence uh, that's ethnographic and ethnohistorical about horticultural societies. So it's not, you know, if, if you pay attention to this, it was never a movement directly from um, I don't think anthropologists in general would think there was a direct move from uh, foraging societies to agriculture as we know it. There is a huge literature on horticultural societies, which are, has, is a, a kind of more flexible uh, cultivation uh, of plants. And you may move around, sometimes it's called slash and burn. Populations are somewhat more mobile, they combine what they're doing with other kinds of um, practices like foraging of various kinds and fishing and so on. And there's a very considerable record of human societies right up until the present having a horticultural adaptation, which doesn't have states or, or cities and is very flexible and it's more associated with women as well. Um, with the idea that women were probably provisioning societies more with reliable um, plant food rather than depending on the vagaries of hunting large animals. So that if women were more accustomed to gathering plants, they were the obvious people to be heavily involved in horticulture. So we have actually more evidence that could be applied and maybe it's in the later chapters because I've just got to the point of reading this. Um, but you know, I think that they didn't focus so much on that because there is a literature on that. Um, and it ought to be opening up our minds and why people haven't used that in their technological know-it-all type versions of, uh, of human history is, um, is puzzling. But this, this is certainly, you know, the focus on possibility is um, really enlightening because especially at the present when we're talking about um, the direction the future is going, 
to, to get out of the sense of being trapped in anything that's inevitable is uh, just so important. That's I all I have to say. I cannot help but notice that this sense that we're trapped into something that is inevitable, it's pretty much a mo relatively modern phenomenon of explained by Mark Fisher, right? This is, this is only the millennial generation has essentially felt that, like the previous generations, I don't know, John McDonald talks about how everyone in those days felt really hopeful and optimistic. And it's just from the eighties onwards that we're all like, um, I don't know, I just wanted to throw that out there because um, it's an interesting focus of, for the book to kind of look into why we're so stuck. Um, I don't know if they did it on purpose, maybe, but it's probably useful for us today to figure out why they got so stuck or how we got so stuck so that we can move forward, mm. if that makes sense. Because previous yeah. generation would have been like, well, we know how to move forward. We just, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the difference with earlier um, generations is there's a similar, I think, tendency to get stuck in the thinking because they rely, because since Rousseau, since the Enlightenment critique of, since the enlightenment uh, counter argument to the indigenous critique relied on, on a stages theory of, of social evolution. I, I think that they're not only talking about the, the way that one's imagination has been reduced over time. And certainly, you know, people my age and younger, I think are, are have, have fallen prey to that. But I think they're also meaning this idea of the, the that humans advance through stages and that this is basically a kind of technological determinism and that today with capitalism that there really can't be anything after capitalism because capitalism brings out you know the best in 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 human nature and is the you know despite its flaws it it produces the greatest um, uh, amount for the greatest number, uh, according to capitalists. And so you're absolutely right that, it, that um, there's a lot of focus on this idea of being stuck, but I think it's not only being stuck, but that stuck in this idea of, of an evolutionary or stage-based kind of progression that, that um, has an inevitable conclusion. Yeah, the thing is, even if you are within that paradigm, like people say we're in this, I don't know, 50s, 40s, that still places them in a place where things can change. They still believe that things could change because, okay, this is the next mode of production. Whereas we seem to have not let go of that old idea of the different modes of production, but we did let go of the idea of possibility of change. Does that make sense? Mm, okay. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yes. Yes. So until this book dropped, you know, right. literally, nobody had told us that these uh, different modes of production was an obsolete idea. So the idea was still there, but we had seemed to got got stuck on the pos on the idea of changing anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. I'm just wondering what's next. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I was just going to comment on what Ellen had said about um, its opposing technological determinism. And I think it's really interesting that the book, this kind of chapter links in that kind of bit where technological determinism as a sort of kind of fake idea, oh, it's all determined by technology, humans, as well as um, kind of mythology and maybe bad education combines to be this image of, oh, well, we had a, you know, um, an agriculture, you know, we had a primitive society, then an agricultural revolution, and then an industrial revolution. And now today we have an information age revolution, you know, that, and it, it comes backwards as a sort of linear framework where people point forward to in that same game to our progress will be into the stars 
with the same people who brought you Facebook and um, um, and and all these other kind of um, you know eating disorder uh, spreading uh, social media um, will will take you to the stars in outer space and it, and it just that kind of that and it, it's but it and although it seems you know uh, pretty simple uh, that that little that chronology of the the you know primitive society the in, you know the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution is is really an easy narrative and that's what people teach all the time in their classes particularly if they're basic classes so it's like a, quite a challenge particularly at a low level of teaching um, to try to bring some of these ideas into the classroom but in a simple way you know it's all, it's always quite hard to say well here's what people used to believe but it's more complicated and still have it be a simple teaching for people. So. May I? I? I think that's true. And there's also been, um, that they might have been influenced by the fact that there was a, a, a strong trend in, um, in, in American anthropology from Leslie White through Marshall Solomons and other people that did take, uh, and, and Julian Stewart, that took a more technological approach. So they're probably writing against that, although they don't talk about it. Um, isn't, isn't that a very basic problem with education in general? If the professors feel they need to know more than their students and they're not prepared to have a conversation, then the whole thing is set up from the start. They need to know, they need to know that what they're saying is right. Uh, and that therefore the student uh, can't challenge them too much, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I've, I'm a musician and I've taught improvisation over many years because it's something I practice myself. And in an improvisation class, you can't do that. Uh, so I've learned a lot of things about how you can relate to students in other ways. Um, because anyway, I would only want it that way. Uh, but, it, and I suppose there's something a little bit anarchist about all that, but I, I feel that this goes back much further than just the last few generations, because if you study philosophy, uh, you have this tremendous thing of the Cartesian, um, you know, the Cartesian <clears throat> uh, paradigm uh, freezing the entire philosophical, philosophical situation of being subjects and objects and all the rest of it. And it's taken a lot of the 20th century to get through that. I'm right now studying the uh, writings of Gendlin. I don't know if anyone else is familiar with his work, but he's one of the key figures. And Karen Barrett is another one who are finding philosophical ways through uh, the philosophical thickets that were set up over hundreds of years. So I don't think there's anything new about feeling stuck. <laughs> Um, one of the things about the when people do technology studies, they look at in well, a concept called interpretive flexibility, which is like if you have a technological object, how people use it is up to them in some sense. And so, um, which doesn't mean that cultures don't have a particular history of using a particular technology in a particular way, um, but it, it does mean that um, that, that the item of technology doesn't presume what the people will do with it. And so that's more or less looking at kind of specific technology objects. Here, what um, uh, Graeber and Wengros seem to be doing is taking a whole suite of technological um, or techniques like agriculture and saying, look, it has interpretive flexibility. Lots of people could do these things in many different, many different ways. So, um, certainly in some cases, maybe you know, agriculture could have been used in a in a particular way. In other way cases, agriculture would be, um, you know, would be used in a, a a matriarchal society, and agriculture could be used in a patriarchal society. Um, what I found surprising was. Um, what Steve was saying at the beginning, that they're really kind of saying um, that, you know, which is kind of a long time left thing from Marx onwards is that the mode of production is what 
I, what um, creates the, 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 the character of abuse in society. Maybe when Marx is writing in the 19th century in the Industrial Revolution, that might apply much more. Um, whereas here, it, it just seems like they're arguing that um, the, the problem comes from people saying, I'm going to turn other people into slaves, or I'm going to use coercion as the process of care. That it really comes out, when it, whether it was this chapter or the last one, where they say, um, they're taking slaves in order to produce people, as in care. Many of the slaves look after the children, prepare the food, all the things that you have to do to produce people. So the care and the production is about producing people, um, producing a society, and that, and that care is there. And if you also put in coercion and violence in the middle of that, that creates the problem. Um, and I... And I, I wonder, there's an old age, age old problem that comes up with the sort of psychoanalysis. Um, when people write a critique of psychoanalysis, is they say, well, psychoanalysis isn't very political. It says that some people were just had really bad childhood or had aggression and then they became terrible people. And this is how evil developed in the world. Whereas the political types would always say, no, it's the class structure, it's aristocracy or people being like not giving resources to families and children prevent that. And it was kind of a, it might've been, maybe that is true, but it was a chicken and egg theory. And it seems like um, here, at least in part, the argument comes to be that, um, it will, that this cruelty as a, some kind of decision or, or, you know, or, you know, or, or what is it is where, is where that emerges rather than a, a political process, which destroys people. It's, it's kind of a, a people process that destroys people first and then maybe creates larger political processes that destroy people. But I suppose it's, it's really important that we should go on believing that we as people can have an effect, uh, that we should always believe that if we, if we give in to the idea that the system is what creates everything, uh, then uh, then, yeah, we get stuck. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. And so much depends on how we understand production. Marx, of course, thought that people, that the mode of production, a capitalist mode of production, meant that people got made in the factories, at the workplace. And of course, they do get made there, but that's only part of where they're made. That's only part of what goes into to making them, uh, which is why I find their use of, of mode of production so satisfying because it isn't, uh, it isn't about producing the objects, though that is a consequence. It's more about how people get produced in the process of producing the product, in producing the objects that they produce as they're being produced. Um, and this idea that that there is a uh, a that there's a direct correlation between a mode of production and the and the political imaginary, um, you know, they do a really good job of of debunking that kind of idea because we can find examples of <laughs> schizogenesis happening where people are deliberately rejecting what the implications of a, of a particular kind of agricultural system or, or different kind of political apparatus or enslavement of people. Yeah, I mean, what I, what I find so, uh, for me, eye-opening as someone who doesn't really know the ancient period, it, I mean, at all, is how the authors, rather than, than cherry picking and using that cherry picking to make an argument that leads to this, this um, process of, of, um, of uh, sedent uh, sedentism and then cities, they show that at any given time, you can have a variety of, of um, 
of social arrangements that people move in and out of, and that there isn't this direct line to what we what we have uh, <laughs> today. But I think that when the ancient world gets taught, it's delib well, I don't know if it's deliberately taught this way, but it ends up being taught in a fairly simplistic way because everyone's sort of going from the ancient period to get to the modern period to understand how we are today. So for instance, ancient civilization courses are typically taught to help explain why we are today the way we are by making reference to the, to the ancient period. So what that ends up, what ends up happening is that scholars end up finding evidence from the past that correspond to how we are today, like the existence of a state or rule of law, and that therefore that must inevitably be um, how we came to be. And so a lot of, I think, ancient scholars of the ancient world, in order to seem relevant, I think that they have have tended to concentrate on social elements that seem to be with us today, whereas what uh, Graeber and Wengro are doing is saying that, that that's a dangerous kind of cherry picking because if we are looking for evidence of how we are today, of course we can find it, but it's it's leaving aside all of the other possibilities of different social arrangements that may have existed back then. And if we only have excavated 5% of, of uh, Chateau Hayek, uh, then you know, how strong are our arguments? And I like that they're, they're very upfront about about the holes in the research, rather than trying to drive a particular point home, they're actually showing where those holes are and that in those holes are the possibilities for al alternate ways of, of understanding human existence. Yeah, that, that restraint continues <clears throat> through, through the rest of the book. And there's, there's a, at least a couple places where I, I started to expect them I was like expecting them to make one argument that would lead to like a simpler explanation. And then they didn't do that. <laughs> they were like, it's not that simple. Things are more complicated. Uh, and it's, it's, it's particularly, I was, I was kind of expecting them to, I don't know, sh are, can I do spoilers <laughs> for the rest of the book? Uh, I was expecting them to basically make the argument that the, the process of sort of something like the modern nation state was going to be schismogenesis creating um, a hierarchical sort of upland society and an egalitarian lowland society, and that the creation of kingship and nation states and all of that across all of the different regions where something like that emerged was those two, those two cultures fusing back together. Um, and uh, they make the argument that that's probably what happened in Mesopotamia, but that in other spaces, things proceeded along very different lines. Um, and I was, I, I was really impressed with them not making that argument because I was really expecting them to go there. And then I was, it was, it was, it was wonderful being like, oh, things are like, like even, even that co more complicated story than the previous narrative is still too simple and still like applying that universally is, is still missing out on a lot of, a lot of the reality. So yeah. Another thing that, that really stood out to me in the chapter um, was their, their uh, investigation of this idea of, of primitive matriarchies. I was not familiar with the work of, of Gimbutas beforehand. I, you know, I, I knew of, the, of, of some of the kind of pop theories about um, uh, prim, so-called primitive matriarchies. But their, their analysis that shows the way that her own work was, was uh, debunked, but then has, some of it has been, been confirmed, um, you know, really allows them to do the kind of in archeological or, or 
sociological um, um, uh, thinking that prevents them for, from making these very unilateral kind of simplistic arguments. And so, you know, they're not there to recover her work in whole, but nor are they there to debunk it entirely. They're showing that these things are much more complicated as, as Matthew said. Um, and that's actually what I like about it is all of that messiness of it. It does make for a challenging read, but I, I do find it to be uh, a lot more satisfying because they're not giving simplistic answers. Um, it's taking them a long way to lay out their arguments because they are so complicated. But, um, you know, that's what's uh, so wonderful about it is that they're able to, and unlike, so unlike most scholars, they're able to refer to the archaeology of the old world and the new world. And so, you know, they will, will soon enough have chapters on Teotihuacan and examples of, of, um, of societies where uh, there, there was conscious refusal of certain kinds of, of, um, of social arrangements. So it's a nice um, point that they make, but I do, I, I wonder if only 5% of Chateau Hoyuk has been uh, excavated. I wonder what, as the excavations go on, what other kinds of complications this might might mean. Because if they're able to to uh, to really complicate scholarship based on just a five percent, you know, it it um, you know, in twenty years we're going to need a, an updated version of this book. And we'll find it was all aliens. We'll find what? It was all aliens. That's a joke for those. Oh, yeah, of all aliens. Yeah. We'll follow David Wenbro because he's been um, on Twitter. He, he just basically says, no, actually, there were not aliens. <laughs> <laughs> this is a whole genre out there. He really. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there, you know, there, there's still some people who say that that's why the Maya. Uh, civilization collapsed because they were visited by aliens. Um, yeah. I, I threw a um, thing in the chat when Matthew was talking about the arguments around the state. There's a recent book by James C. Scott, which re is really a review book of all the archaeology in the Middle East. And there was somebody who did a PhD a couple of years ago and kind of really made the case about this agriculture was done in a, what you call alluvial agriculture, that people didn't have fields and plant stuff, that the easiest way was you just threw seeds down and then you came back in the mm. autumn and you picked it up. And it was really like mm. the least work you could do. It was not at all like what people normally think of as farming today is backbreaking work. And um, and against against the grain was kind of the argument. Um, and, and, and I think Graber and Wengro's book here actually in some ways even goes further than the, the Scott book. Um, um, but like, because they were really arguing how um, how the early state was sort of um, difficult to like maintain. It was really a failure and it didn't really exist. People ran away from it usually. Um, and, and, that, um, and the grain, I guess, was uh, one of the ways that you could grab hold of things um, you could you could control wealth with grain. So because grain is um, and in modern days that fits very well because grain is fungible. Um, when you look at the global economy, they try to there's a the United Nation the you know the G uh, eight I think or it could be the G twenty has an, a a global wheat program to get more wheat. Wheat is associated with a meat eating diet and westernization of your diet. Um, in the 1950s, 60s, the first um, derivatives for the stock market were done on grain because you can bet on the harvest. Um, 
So there's grain has a long history. And the regional reason is grain is what you call fungible, like money is. You can each one is the same. So you can make it, you can trade it like money. If you have different, you know, if you go to if you have different types of things that you're trading, I'll give you potatoes for wheat or you know, or or secret Santa presents, and everybody has a different present. You can't just they're not all the same, whereas uh, same bushels of wheat. So there's all kinds of this stuff that comes out of the history of wheat. Um, and then goes back and it all gets rooted back and put fit onto this agricultural revolution myth of this area. And so they don't even really talk too much about that, but their book kind of pulls the rug out from all of that as well. And it was just, I, I didn't have anything particularly intelligent to say regarding what Steve was saying about the, the matriarchy thing, but I was quite excited by the, the, the idea of these um, Neolithic uh, mat matriarchy kind of cults, but not so much back then, but how much they played in the early 20th century and in the 1970s um, as people all believed that there were Neolithic matriarchy cults. The, like the remark about the guy who was one of Freud's students, Otto someone, who went on and on about Neolithic matriarchal cults and Jung got all his ideas from uh, that, that the unconscious was about unconscious matriarchal cults and Jung left out the matriarchy but took collective unconscious. And um, oh, and, and the woman that you, that Steve was talking about from the 1970s, she's basically blamed for being an eco feminist, you know, the like the kind of um, goddess worshiping, and that was considered unhip. Um, and then so they wrote her out of agriculture, wrote about her out of anthropology. So I guess um, Neolithic matriarchy cults are, are in again. We can do uh, costume parties for them at some point. Um, I'm just going to add this link because um, when, this, when they were talking about weed, um, it reminded me of this really good essay by Robin Wall Kimmerer. I don't know if you guys heard of her. She's a botanist and um, Native American. And so she tells the story of how Native Americans changed, essentially dom domesticated is not really right, the right word, created the corn plant, basically. The corn plant was like a little asparagus with like five kernels and it came, became, you know, this massive plant that produces so much. So I'm just gonna link it there if you guys are interested. It's, it's, it's fascinating, it, it really, goes to show how advanced they were to create something like that. I just threw out a quick remark on the, um, if anyone sees any resonances. So Donna Haraway has done a bunch of work um, and, and she, um, she did the, you know, the what is the the companion species manifesto, where she really argues that it's dog like dogs that colonize humans mm -hmm. as much as humans domesticate dogs, and you know, and so, um, and then some people have followed this. Oh, that's being attention to other species and this kind of care for other species is what Donna Haraway is sort of arguing, and. Um, and then that has followed on. There's the some people who talk about this kind of has corn has maize colonized us, or you know. And I was interested to know what people thought of that kind of argument, where it where it comes, because it definitely kind of it comes out of that whole original cyborg manifesto where Donna Airway says, I'd rather be um, a cyborg than a goddess. And then she goes on and kind of hides out from the cyborg manifesto because it kind of is problematic for her and follows her around, does the companion species manifesto. And then we have here the, the extension of that, what are other species doing um, and in relationship to humans and that kind of agency of other species is brought right down to the level of plants and, you know, and did agriculture colonize us? You know, it becomes- yeah, that's as, nice. True. Yeah, I think it's um, interesting how we've been almost conditioned to think of agriculture as monoculture. <laughs>
that's sort of why I wanted to share this because um, when we <clears> think <throat> of the corn plant, we think of an ear of corn and we see all of the little kernels exactly the same color. If you look at the original plant, like the, the ones that Native Americans are still growing because you know there's they still have the seeds. You have an ear of corn and with full of little kernels that are all different colors. So they would systematically, you know, they would have a system for choosing which ones to plant in order to create variety. It's fascinating. And they're really, really advanced. I think there's an interesting bit in the chapter about different ways of science. So you can have the ones that have the more careful observation, as you've just referred to almost as opposed to the simplified propaganda around science as something in rather like monoculture. Aren't human beings a bit monoculture themselves <laughs> in a certain sense? Maybe that's what uh, Graeber is really uh, getting at. <laughs> well, it could be, but you could link it. You mentioned, I think, Descartes, and you could look at yeah. the whole mind your mind is more real than matter, which you could also link to Protestant views of your religion is what you believe, not what you do. So there's a line of argument that says that embodied approaches are the counter to that. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Sorry. Can I can I just throw one other like uh, fun thing? Uh, one of the things that sort of was really brought up in the like against the grain is sort of things being fungible all of it being the same um and one of the one of the points one of the things that that the davids talk about throughout the book that i found really compelling is sort of the two different senses of equality the two different ways of thinking about egalitarianism being uh either everybody is is very much the same in the ways that matter or that everybody is so different that you can't compare them. Like either everybody is equal or everybody is incomparable. Um, and it seems like the approach to you know agriculture between these two societies, there was much more of a push towards uniformity. Everything will be fungible. Everything will be exactly the same versus uh, sort of in like the Western version of Western version of corn versus the indigenous corn, which is much more sort of diversity things are fundamentally different. They're not necessarily better than each other. They're useful for different purposes. Um, and how one of the sort of, when you take that framework of people being fundamentally different in the, and therefore incomparable, it's harder to construct a system whereby you say, I, I up here am true. You, you are equal in the eyes of the law. You are not equal in the sense of you are free, you are equal in the sense that I treat I as the lawgiver, I as the, the higher power treat you all the same. And so sort of on that route, there's, there's sort of, there's, there's more of a, a route to kingship um, and, and structures of sort of like central, centralized inequality rather than sort of, I don't know, things that are a little bit more free form. Anyway. I want to be mindful of time. It's 10 minutes past four, so this might be a good uh, place to conclude. Um, so thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, Nika, when, so are we going back to Thursdays as our days, or are we keeping Mondays? Yeah, maybe, so I'm sorry, Simone is not here. She put yeah. together a, a schedule, and they're talking with Vasily about that. So okay. my understanding is that we are doing Thursday every two weeks okay. until we finish that. And then uh, Vasily and you know some other people, they're putting everything around this reading group okay. because this is the longest one. <laughs> okay. All right. So yeah, I, I thank you for your, <laughs> for your patience as we kind of you know, figure out a, a, a set time. So um, I'll send out another, I'll send out an email for when that next one is. I'm assuming it's two weeks from this week, but on Thursday. And we've been uh, keeping the, the 8 p.m. London time. Uh, and so I think that will, will uh, continue to be the, the case. But we'll do chapter seven next. And uh, until then, I hope all of you have a, a, a great time out there and, uh, you know, eat the rich. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs>
Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.